welcome back to Futurama with Nerds. I'm Alex Billings. This is my co-host Ryan Lecknoise. Hello. All right. And today we'll be doing episode 203, When Aliens Attack. So this episode originally aired on November 7th, 1999 and was written by Ken Keeler, who, as we've discussed, is, you know, a very prominent writer. He's the second person to do a second episode. He also wrote the series as Landed, the second episode of the series originally. Yep. Uh, but yeah, we'll get into this one here. So it opens actually in the past which would have been the present at the time, 2000, or 1999. Yeah. With Fry doing a pizza delivery to his local Fox affiliate, and he's right in the station, like, to the guy who's actually running everything. And he comes in, and the guy asks if he wants to stay and watch. It's the season or series finale of a show called Jenny McNeil. Well, I think the show is called Single Female Lawyer, the main character Jenny McNeil, which is very much a play on Allie McBeal, which was a show from the time that was very popular about a single female lawyer. Yep. But Fry's not sure he wants to watch it first. Says he likes shows that are in the form of the world's blankiest blank. And the guy says she's wearing the world's shortiest skirt. So Fry agrees to sit down and watch. So he cracks a beer open from the order and they watch a little bit of the show. It, you know, plays a little bit and it's just the tropes of, you know, the guy hitting on her and all that stuff. But then Fry spills his beer and knocks the channel off the air. And the guy's like, oh no, you knocked Fox off the air. And Fry's like, pfft. Like anyone on earth would care. Just, you know, a little dig at Fox again, who was their parent company at the time. Fox is one of those companies that seems like everybody makes fun of them despite working for them. Like that doesn't happen with other networks so much, but Fox seems to just get ripped on all the time. I think it's one of those things that uh, like a lot of adult animation does it. And I think it's just sort of accepted as that's one of the tropes of it. Because like The Simpsons does it and Family Guy does it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but like you never see anything making fun of like Comedy Central or anything like that too often. But Fox always gets always gets made fun of. Yeah, I don't know. I guess that's just a thing. Yeah, I'm not against it. It's funny, but I'm just just wondering why. <laughs> yeah, uh, but then it shows the like antenna from the station and you see the radio waves like broadcasting the show and they're going out and it goes out into space and continues to zoom further and further out till eventually they get to Omicron Percy I-9, which is thousand light years from Earth. And I guess Omicron Percy I is a real star that's about a thousand light years from Earth. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's one of those little things that Ken Keeler put in real science to do. So it's a real, I don't know about the planets, but the star is Omicron Percy I. Uh, yeah, and this is the eighth or ninth planet, right? It was Omicron Percy I eight uh, or it's nine? nine? It is nine? Okay. Yeah. But either way, it's one of those like, you didn't need to do that. No, it's eight. Omicron Percy I eight. Yeah, Omar Crump yeah. yeah. They didn't need to make it a real star, but why not? <laughs> yeah, for sure. They could have just made it up. And then they go into like this little house and you have these two giant aliens. And I do love that they don't really talk about this at all. But for some reason, the aliens are like huge and they're in a tiny place. Like it's like they took it over from tiny regular sized people. Like their couch is teeny tiny below them and they look like they would barely fit through the doorways. Why wouldn't they just build a house that's appropriate size for them? Maybe they did take it away from another race. Like they say, women are from Omar Crump Percy I-7 and men are from Omar Crump Percy I-9. I I mean, maybe, but the door actually has the horns carved into the top of the door for them to go through, too. Yeah, I got to be added afterwards, though. I guess. But anyways, this is the introduction to a couple of big characters here. It's Lur and Nda Nda. They're great. Lur is fantastic. Yeah, they're, you know, the rulers of the planet. But they're essentially they're watching the show, the single female lawyer. And then it cuts out like right after it starts and they get mad. Lur bangs on the TV. It doesn't work. And then it just comes up and says, due to technical difficulties, they'll now show eight animated shows in a row. Then he gets mad and shoots the TV. Yeah. And then there's the show's opening. Yeah, that was another cold opening because, again, they did a bunch of those early on. They kind of get away from them, but... Yeah, it seems like almost every episode in the first season did one now. I forgot. I always forget that until I go back and rewatch it because they don't do that later. So at least production first season. Yeah. I think I think it might be every episode. It could be. Up to this point, it has been for sure. Yeah. So they do the opening. They come back and it's now in the year 3000 again. The, you know, present slash future. However you want to look at it. The present for the show. Yeah. The show's current timeline. Yeah. And Hermes walks in and he sees Bender and Fry sitting on the couch and he gets mad that they're not working. Smacks them with a newspaper and they tell him it's uh, Labor Day and Hermes pretty much just immediately joins in with them happy to have a day off yeah everyone's happy to have a day off like why wouldn't you be yeah and then Leela and the rest of the crew come up they ask if they all want to go to the beach Bender and Hermes immediately agree Fry doesn't want to go he says he just wants to stay and watch TV and she's like you need to go out and experience the real world he's like this is HD TV it's got better definition than the real world and then she basically forces him to come saying he's covered in bed sores not everywhere. Yeah, I don't know. He's not covered. <laughs> he admits that there's a lot of them, but there's a few places that are fine. Yeah, he's got a few spots. But yeah, they cut to them in their car going to the beach. They get to the beach and it's a place called Monument Beach. And it goes out and they have all these famous monuments from around the world there. The Sphinx, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, Mount Rushmore, the White House, uh, the Easter Island Heads. Probably a couple more that I'm just... They have Randy's Donuts. Yeah, that is a real thing from like LA. Oh, is it? 
Yeah, it's like the famous big giant donut on top of the place. Oh, yeah. They okay. do it in like Iron Man 2. He goes and sits in it. Oh, is that Randy's Donut specifically? I didn't notice that. I don't know if it's Randy's. I know there's like a famous donut place in LA. that I'm assuming if that's what they called it there, that's probably what it is. Probably. Yeah, and then this first act's kind of interesting in that they just sort of have them doing random stuff on the beach. Yeah, I noticed that when we were watching, there was a lot of just like cold cut scene jokes sort of thing. Like, yeah, it's just lots of little jokes. I mean, it starts actually with Fry saying he didn't realize all these monuments were in New York. And then like they are now in the 2600s, New Yorkers elected a super villain governor and he stole all the world's monuments. And then Fender's like, yeah, he was great. Look at him up there. And you see that he's carved himself into Mount Rushmore. And he looks very much like an evil mad scientist. Yeah, exactly. He's got like the evil grin and giant goggles and stuff. Yeah, it's it's a good joke. I will say, as we get into this, this is one of the best first acts of the show so far, I think. I think it's an extremely strong first act. Yeah, I mean, it's good. It's Like I said, it's just interesting in that it's nothing in the first act really matters. It's all just pretty much jokes of them on the beach. Yeah, it's all just setting up for when the Omicronians show up and start death raying all of the monuments. Yeah, somewhat. But it's even the jokes themselves are largely unconnected. It's just sort of stuff happening. They have like, you know, they show Lila Lou's using sunscreen and then Zoidberg using butter instead because he's a lobster. Yeah. They're playing volleyball and Zoidberg keeps popping it on his claws and gets mad and scuttles off into the water. Which is the first time you see him do his sideways scuttle. Yep, which is great. Yeah, he goes for a walk and like Bender and or Hermes is using a metal detector and it turns out he's looking for Bender's hiding under the sand. And then he's like, I'll go hide and you look for me now. And Bender just throws the metal detector away and leaves. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of one-off jokes, but for whatever reason, they all land for me. Yeah, there's some pretty solid ones. It's just, like I said, it's just funny that it's, it's almost like they just wasted time doing it. Like they were just filling time. Yeah, and that could very well be it. They needed to just like, pad out the first act a bit. Yeah, maybe. Probably the most like meaty one is they have Fry making a sand castle, and you know, there's a stereotypical beach bully comes up and kicks his castle over, and then like starts hitting on Leela, and Leela's like, "I don't like bullies, no matter how attractive they are." And Fry's like, "It's fine, Leela. Go ahead. I got a lot of work rebuilding here." And he starts remaking a sand castle, and the guy explains, "He's like, um, I'm actually a professional beach bully. You know, I kick your castle, hit on your girl, you punch me, I go down, you slip me fifty bucks." To which Fry's like, "Out." that he would pay $50 even if Leela was his girlfriend. Yeah, it seems like it'd be an absurd price for the services of a beach bully. <laughs> so then Leela kind of hits on the guy a bit. She's like, well, maybe I could actually go with you. And he's just like, no, thanks. I'm actually gay. And just leaves. And, you know, they, they keep, there's some other little jokes, but that's pretty much what's going on. And then at the end of the day, they're taking a big group photo. And uh, they establish that Bender's head, I guess, works as a camera. Like his, his one eye zooms out as the lens. And then he wants to get in the shot. So he takes his head off and leaves it on the ground so his body can walk in. Yeah, puts it on a time delay. Yeah. And as they're posing, a shadow comes over and it goes up and you see like a big UFO with kind of little legs on the side. I don't know, a little claw leg. Yeah, it's like part UFO, part crab kind of without the crab pincers but like that's like the cra crab legs kind of yeah it's got the little legs all the way around yeah but anyways they do the the shot from independence day where they destroy the white house and then they destroy all the other monuments they even have a little tiny one come down and blow up fry's sandcastle which like is what fry's most upset about yeah i like when they push over the leaning tower of pisa but they don't push it the direction it's already leaning they push it the opposite direction of the one that's leaning so it the topples over yeah it goes the opposite way so it's straight for a second first yeah i thought that was funny yeah and that's actually the the end of the first act there and then it comes back though it's just them running away in their car they get back to the planet express headquarters and you see the aliens sort of everywhere attack and uh, Fry's like, they're going to kill us all. And Presser's like, oh, probably. But the last time aliens attacked, they just took the most intelligent of us and forced us to mate over and over again. Oh, yes. <laughs> like, puts in breath spray. Yeah, is this... I'm trying to think. When did uh, he stop doing his I'm already in my pajamas catch? He only did first? that twice. Just the first two episodes. Is it just the first two? Yeah. He okay. never so I was going to say, they haven't said it in a while. Nope. Just the first two episodes. That's it. It's a shame. Then the uh, the TV comes on and it's the news report. And it's interesting actually here because Linda's there, the human news reporter, but Morbo's not there. Yeah. Which is weird because you normally see both of them. In the commentary, they were talking about that a little, how that's weird. And they're like, they couldn't remember if they did that on purpose or it was just because Linda and Morbo had only been in one other episode so far anyways. So they're just like, maybe we only need one. They didn't want to use the alien one because it could get confused with the idea of the aliens attacking. Yeah, they want it to be like the human reporting on the aliens attacking against humans sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, like that's it. But she uh, she basically just goes live to the president of Earth giving his address, which is this the first time they establish, I think, that Earth has one president. Uh, I think so. They might have mentioned it before, but this is definitely the first time you see him. And it's President McNeil. Yep. And he's, you know, giving a speech about how he's like, we should just really get down on our knees and lick boot. Give our new alien overlords whatever they want. And then the 
Lur cuts in on control and he announces himself as ruler of Omicron Percy I-8 and that they're there for McNeil and they'll take nothing else. Then it cuts back to the president and he's like, so as I was saying, we're going to reject these alien masters and defend our planet. Yeah, because it's President McNeil after all, yeah, right? Like, we won't give up this McNeil, whoever he is. Clearly thinking that they're referring to him as president of Earth, which... Well, that's what everyone's thinking. Yeah, why wouldn't they? Right, so and then he announces Zap Brannigan's going to lead Earth's defense. So we have, you know, Zap returning for his third episode already. He's still fantastic. Like, I forget how great he is until he shows on screen. He's, he's a great yeah. guy character he's introduced as five-star general which from the first time he's appeared he was a captain and now he's a five-star general yeah but because he destroyed he defeated the pacifists of the gandhi nebula yeah exactly his five-star general fresh off defeating the pacifists of the gandhi nebula (laughs) which is a great joke again yeah so then zap comes on and he essentially establishes that he's a drafting everyone on earth with a ship and they need to report for duty anyone without a ship is supposed to just find a weapon and fire randomly into the air yeah they're going (laughs) full-blown yeah so leela's like well we're drafted i guess we better go and bender tries to not go he's like a conscientious objector you know coward then uh zap establishes they're gonna activate the patriot chips and all robots and he pushes the button and then the top of bender's antenna glows and he's suddenly you know super excited to join up against his will yeah and then you know they have them on the dupe ship leela and them and it's zap giving a speech to all the new recruits about how you know doesn't care what race they are essentially they're all going to work together to destroy any alien and then kiff's like well except for me and he's like right no one destroy kiff unless you have to and he finds leela hits on her and he's like uh we can maybe restart the human race or something he says something about that and then she's like well technically i'm not human he's like right no one destroy leela either yeah because they've kind of established well they haven't established but I guess in episode one, they mentioned that she's an alien. Yeah, they say Leela's an alien. That's why she has one eye. Yeah, and they haven't really changed that yet, which they will in future episodes. But as it stands right now, she is still an alien. Yeah, and they do one random shot of them talking about bed making, which is just sort of another random joke inserted. It's not that it's bad. Yeah, it's it's very clearly a filler joke. Yeah, it's another filler joke scene where he's just talking about how they'll be making their beds over and over to get it perfect and how they won't have any time for anything else. Not with all the bed making they'll be doing. Yeah, they'll get so good at making their bed that they'll do it in their sleep Yeah, while they're sleeping in it, but there won't be enough time for sleep because they'll be making their bed too much. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And then they have the, uh, the scene of them planning their attack, which is clearly based off Star Wars... The first one, right? With yeah, uh, Mon Mothma? Mon Mothma? I guess. Like, is that the first one? Yeah, that's episode four. Yeah, yeah episode four. Yeah, it's, it's it's referencing the standard Star Wars sci-fi trope of planning the attack, but it's not anything directly referencing Star Wars, but well, it's just kind of Well, they actually talk in the commentary that is a, it is a reference to that scene. I guess it's based on that scene, but it's not like they have the trench run or anything like that. No, but the it's like the round room and the, the center console thing showing it, all that is... Yeah, it's very based off of Star Wars Episode Four for sure. Yeah, so essentially uh, Zap just establishes that their plan is to destroy the mothership. And I think that should take out all the other ships. And Fry's like, well, wouldn't it make more sense to send the robots in first? And then Bender starts choking him to stop him. But Zap hits the button again and Bender's like, I just volunteer for a suicide mission. Brannigan's just like, that's very brave of you, son. But when you're working with me, every mission's a suicide mission. Yeah, he doesn't even try to hide it. He knows. Well, I think he thinks he's bragging, but he's he's not. (laughs) Yeah. So then, you know, they have them in their ships going to head out to the attack. And Fry's even got like a helmet similar to the Star Wars helmets from when they're in the uh, the X-Wings and stuff. Yep. And he's up in the gunner seat in the Planet Express ship. And he's like, this is great. I'm going to be a sci-fi hero, just like Uhura or Captain Janeway or Xena. (laughs) Xena's kind of sci-fi. I mean, she's not. She's fantasy, but... It's yeah. it's still, it's, it's another good joke. It's also worth knowing that he mentions three female characters, which, good for him. Yeah. yeah. Like, like good for him. Yeah, but Leela tells him this is real life, not TV. Does he know the difference? He's like, of course I do. Just like TV better. And he starts making the sound effects, which is weird because the guns do make their own sound effects. I guess he's not supposed to start shooting yet. Still, yeah, yeah. But they start their attack and they're, you know, doing some strafing runs. The Planet Express ship gets shot by the, the mothership, like the big Omicronian ship. And Leela asks for a status report from Bender and he's like, auxiliary power's out. And they spilled my martini. And Fry's like, this one's for Bender's martini. And they do one more run where I guess their gun is supercharged or something because they just shoot it like four times and it blows up the ship. Yeah, they hit it in all the perfect weak spots, sir. I guess, yeah. So they destroy it, it blows up, and, you know, they start celebrating. Bender starts making new martinis. Zap Brannigan comes down on the screen, essentially congratulating everyone. And right as they're talking, though, these lights come on in the sky behind them. And it zooms out, and there's a much bigger ship. And they're like, what the hell is that? And Kip's like, it appears to be the mothership. Zap goes, well, what did we just blow up? Kip looks at the map, he's like, the Hubble Telescope. (laughs) <laughs> which even it's funny in the commentary ken keeler who wrote the episodes like no no they didn't that's not what the hubble telescope looks like but i wrote this but 
Well, he probably didn't write that joke. No, yeah. But yeah, David X. Cohen's just like, well, they've had a thousand years of updates on it. (laughs) Yeah, it's still a funny joke, despite like everyone watching knows that they blew up a ship that looks exactly like the Omicronian ship. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly one of those ships. But it's still a good joke. (laughs) Apparently, it's the Hubble telescope of the year 3000. Yep. And then the mothership starts just destroying all the ships. And Leela's like, well, this is stupid. If we're going to die, we might as well do it at home. So she reverses back and they run back to the Planet Express headquarters and they come in and they're you know again they're like we're all gonna die and professor's like i'm starting to think there's not gonna be any forced mating this time yeah then the news comes on again and it's president mcneil and he's you know giving a speech about how they won't cow down earth's gonna stand united and zap brannigan's behind him so i guess zap also survives as the established thing here i mean we obviously know he's gonna survive yeah he's a major character he's not going anywhere yeah but while mcneil's talking he grabs like a burlap sack and puts it over his head and starts dragging him away which the rest of the gathered world leaders start clapping. Yeah, everyone else is fine with it. They just, McNeil is the only person. Like, we're good. Well, yeah, the one guy who looks like a judge even kicks the bag because it's getting dragged away. Yeah. And he takes them out to the, uh, I guess the mothership has now landed on the White House lawn. Not the lighthouse that they exploded, but the actual White House. I don't know if it's a White House, actually. It might just be a government building there, but. I mean, they did explode the White House in the Independence Day scene at the starting. (laughs) I mean, in future episodes, they do establish that there is a White House in Washington still. So they either rebuilt a new one or something. But anyways, he knocks on the door, learn into Inda, open it, and the bag comes down. And they're just like, who's this? Zap's like, it's McNeil. It's like, this isn't the McNeil we want. Uh, President McNeil's like, thank you. Thank you, Masters. Lur just pulls a gun out and vaporizes them. (laughs) Yeah, they don't really care at all, right? Yeah, he just means nothing to them. No, he's completely irrelevant, alive or dead. And they established, like, I mean, the McNeil we're looking for is the single female lawyer. She wears tiny mini skirts and is struggling to succeed in a, or is struggling as a single female in a single male's world. And then Fry's like, I guess watching on TV, I guess there's news cameras here. And he's like, wait, I know her. And they're like, no, you don't, you big fat liar. I do like that line. You don't know anybody. All you do is watch TV. He's like, that's where I know her from, TV. He essentially remembers it was a show that was on in the past. And, you know, they're all like, well, how are we going to get them a show from a thousand years ago? And Amy looks it up and she finds out that the series finale got cut off after 40 seconds of airing because someone spilled soda on the console and fries like beer i mean i would think and they established that there's no recordings of it because all videotapes were destroyed in 24 something during the second coming of jesus yeah which begs some questions yeah i guess jesus came back and the world just kept going but like vi- videotapes were around for 400 more years <laughs> well i guess recordings maybe of, of any kind i guess if it just it wiped out all DVD, video, streaming, stuff like that of the past. Yeah, and uh, the Omicronians are on the news and they establish that they're going to raise the temperature of Earth 1 million degrees a day for five days unless they see the, the episode by 9 o'clock tomorrow, which I guess they don't understand that just that one day is going to do it. No, they're just, they have no idea. The best part about the Omicronians is like they really don't, care about earth or anything else to the point where they don't even know anything about earth or any place else they're just like yeah one million degrees whatever (laughs) yeah but then fry says he saw the first 40 seconds of that episode he can write a new one and they all agree they're gonna try to put it on so they quickly build a pretty impressive set yeah a really impressive set considering how fast they did it and he casts leela to play jenny mcneil she doesn't want to at first because she's nervous and amy's like plus you don't really have the thighs for a miniskirt give me the script yeah it takes it out of spite (laughs) Yeah, and they even uh, put a little googly eye on her, so she has two eyes, and they start filming the episode, and they're airing it directly to the Omicronians so they can watch it live, and they show the Omicronians getting ready to watch in their ship, and it comes on, and it's, they're just like in a trial, and they're just doing lots of legalese and, you know, junk that would be on that type of show, talking, and uh, eventually Leela ends up on the stand, and Zoidberg's talking to her, and he's like, where were you on the night of De- September 5th or whatever? And she's like, sleeping with you. And he's like, aha. And he turns around, and his claw impales her little googly eye, and then he eats it. And the funny thing with that is they said in the commentary that the eye was meant to be on for the rest of the episode, but it was just too much of a pain for animation. Oh, so they yeah. added that in where he t- rips it off and eats it. I get it. I get that, because like the googliness of it would have it move every time she moved and stuff like that. So I understand how that could be just like a nuisance. Yeah, it was just to save time and money. Yeah, which makes sense. Yeah, and then uh, Leela realizes that their script's gone, and she's like, Fry, what? there's no more words here. He's like, I don't know, that took me an hour to write. I figured it would take an hour to read. Yeah, it was like two pages of script only. Yeah, it was two pages of dialogue, and then he's like, just just vamp. Just make it good. And then Leela's like, all right, I'm, uh, I'm giving up the law, and I'm giving up being single. And she's like, your honor, and the judge is the professor. And she's like, will you marry me? And then Fry's like, no, go to commercial. Bender cuts it to commercial, because Bender's working as the 
video camera because yeah. they established his eyes work as cameras. And then he comes out to Leela and he's like, you can't do that. And she's like, why not? It's clever. It's, uh, what's the other word she uses? Unexpected. Unexpected, yeah. And then Fry's like, clever things make people feel stupid. And unexpected things make them feel scared. And then immediately the Omicronians cut onto the TV screen and they're like, McNeil, it's like, your decision to leave the law scares us. <laughs> and he's like, we fell in love with you as a single female lawyer and as such you shall remain. Fry's just like, it's okay. Just read these cue cards. They come back from the commercial and the professor's like miss mcneil i must turn down your proposal as i am sick cough and then fall over dead and then he just sits there waiting even though he doesn't understand that it was you know scene direction at that point yeah he was reading the action lines more so than the dialogue yeah exactly he's supposed to cough and fall over dead but he's just sitting there waiting and then zoidberg just goes my god he's dead and then i love this the professor like checks his pulse yeah there's like he's in the background it's not even like the focus of the shot but you just see him like am i dead yeah, exactly. No, I'm still alive. <laughs> like, he thinks there's a possibility that he might have died. Yeah. So then it just establishes that McNeil isn't going to get married and she's going to remain a single female lawyer. And Hermes, who's the foreman of the jury, is like, we decide you as vulnerable yet spunky. And everyone cheers. And that's the end of the episode. Well, the end of their little fake episode. Yeah. And then Lur comes on the TV again and he's like, it's like, McNeil, here's the review of the episode. Overall, we give it a C plus. Okay. Not great. I like how beforehand they established to prepare the water cooler so that we may discuss things about this afterwards. Yeah. And the background where he's giving his rating, you get to see a couple people by the water cooler pouring a drink. I'm like, that's yeah. pretty clever. Yeah, discussing the episode. And he's like, so we won't destroy Earth, but neither will we give you our uh, ingredients for immortality. And Fry's just like, wait, overact, Zoidberg. <laughs> the Omicronians leave because they have to get back in time for the end of a thousand year old Leno monologue. Yep. So they take off and they leave and then everyone's like, you did it, Fry, you saved Earth. And he's like, yep, you just have to know the secrets of TV. At the end of the episode, everything's exactly the same and it zooms out and the whole city's destroyed. Yeah, which they, of course, they don't come back to the next episode. Yeah, exactly. In the next episode, everything's fine because that's literally it. It fades to black. And that's the end of the episode. Yep. So this is this is a solid episode. It's very self-contained. Like, except for the fact that it introduces the Omicronians, it really could have been told anywhere. Yeah, you could fit this into any section of this. Like, it could have been the third episode of the season, for example. Yeah, and again, interestingly, like, a lot of it is just filler jokes, which isn't bad. Again, like, I enjoy a lot of them. I think it's a good episode. Yeah. Not a lot of it even pushes the story of this episode. No, I agree. Like, I, I mentioned that I do think it's one of the best first acts, but... It is the best first act with just irrelevant stuff. But for whatever reason, every filler joke really lands with me. So I quite enjoy it. Yeah, like it seems like almost the entire story of this episode is in that third act when yep. they're making and like broadcasting the third epi or the episode. Like that could have easily have been the whole episode in itself. Yeah, but instead they, they put it to the third one. And I don't know, whatever they did, it seems weird, but it worked for me. I yeah. think this is a very good episode. No, I agree. It's, it's definitely a solid one. You know, it says again, it introduces the idea of the Earth president. It also has him be destroyed which is you know setting up some future stuff with the new president of earth yep which we'll get to in later episodes of course yeah stuff like that you know the omicronians obviously come back quite a bit yeah they're, i mean they're great characters yeah i'm pretty sure lur was on our top five side characters when we did that list. yeah lur was up there too i think he was like three or two or something like lur is really great he's a good character yeah, yeah. so what was your top joke of this episode so i have two i like bender's opening song for the show yeah. the single female lawyer uh, fighting for her clients, wearing mini skirts and being self-reliant. Yeah. I like that song. I quote it a lot. It's not that funny, but for whatever reason that, that I hold on to that. And then when Zoidberg is in the water in the first act and he gets trapped in the lobster cage and yeah. he just Bender's walking around the bottom of the water floor. He goes, Bender, you got to spring me. I'm too pretty to go to jail. Yeah. And yeah, Bender bends the... Bends the wooden crates open. The and wood open and Zoidberg runs away. And I like how the other two little lobsters also escape. I just like there's underwater spotlights that light them up like a full jailbreak. I thought that's, I think that's a clever joke. I like that one. Yeah, that's pretty solid. For me, it was the one we talked about before where uh, the professor like coughs, falls over dead and then like, he's dead. I just And then him checking his pulse is always so great to me because it's such a little background thing. But it's just the idea of the professor's like, oh, maybe I am dead. Yeah. No, no, I'm good. It's not even in the foreground of the shot. It's just, it's in the back right corner. You see him like, am I? Yeah, and like no one mentions it, like it's not talked about. It's just the idea that he believes there's a legitimate possibility that he's dead. Yeah, I, I agree. That is that's quite a good one. A nice little background gag, which I enjoy. So I think this was a solid episode. I gave it a 75. I gave it an 86. I quite enjoy this one. I think it's my second favorite so far. Again, I don't know why, because story structure wise, it's not great. 
It's a lot of one-off jokes, but I don't know, for whatever reason, every one-off joke lands for me. No, like I said, I, I do think this is quite a good episode. I think it's just, it doesn't stand out as like one of the best episodes to me, which I think why I gave it a 75, you know, it's a nice solid score. That That's fair. A mid B. Yeah, of all the ones I'm watching that we've watched so far, I definitely think this was one that I was looking forward to the most and one that I enjoyed watching the most outside, of course, of my favorite, the Hell is Other Robots so far, yeah. but I still really like this episode. Yeah, that's fair. But yeah, so that brings us to the, the end of our review here of When Aliens Attack. But uh, yeah, that's the end of this episode here. You can join us next week where we'll be reviewing Fry and the Slurm Factory, which I mean, from the title, I think a lot of people can know what that's referring to. Yep. But that's a good episode. So we'll be ready to see that up next time. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Goodbye.